Okay, Constance, thank you so much for being here. Um, so I think I want to start with your origin story at SMAC, um, because you have been doing this job for 14 years, specifically at SMAC. So take us back and tell us sort of how everything got started. First, thank you guys for having me, and I hope uh, everyone's trying to stay as cool as possible with, with yes. the fans here, stay hydrated. Um, so the origins of SMAC, you have to kind of go back even further. Um, I started at the National Football League in 1991, before a lot of you were born, um, as an assistant in the corporate sponsorship department, and then worked my way up and around for about a decade, 10 seasons, as we like to say. Um, I ran into Barry, who reminded me that uh, we gave NSYNC their start, just kidding, um, when they did the Pro Bowl, I think, for us. Um, and that was one of the entry points for me into the entertainment industry. So SMAC stands for sports, media, and culture. So combined everything I learned at the NFL, went to a record company for a minute um, at Arista. It was great, but I realized I was probably five years ahead of my time doing branded marketing and strategic partnerships for the artists, and then I left, moved to Hollywood to work at the firm. Again, strategic partnerships, marketing, incorporating it all. I mean, it was a hated word back in the day, but synergy. So I would just run around working with all the different managers and, and departments to just figure out how to navigate everything. And I ended up managing Snoop Dogg, who's now taking over the Olympics. Um, you may have heard of him. <laughs> We had an awesome run together. I joke, seven years, 49 dog years. Um, but when I turned 40, I just said, I love you, but I can't do this anymore. And at that point, when I was winding down with Snoop, Strahan had just retired. Coach Prime and I connected. And I went off on my own. Um, for any of you that have ever um, been fired, sometimes it's the best thing to ever happen. That's what happened to me. And I uh, ended up launching Smack. I'll get it. All right. And um, yeah, so, so that's what kind of started it. Thank you. It was one other part. Very important prop for yeah, later in the my conversation. Prop for later. I screwed things up already. Um, so fast forward, um, Strahan had a sitcom on Fox. Uh, it didn't go so well, but it was great because he knew what he didn't want to do. And Coach, well, he was then Deion Sanders. Now we call him Coach Prime. And he just needed to kind of get his uh, marketing back out there. And about a year into SMAC, Strahan was a client. I said, why don't you throw down and just become the third partner, similar to what like Jay-Z was doing with Rock Nation or Bon Jovi on his own. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. Amazing. Um, so since then, the sports marketing world has changed so much. I mean, even since I've been at front office sports in the last four years, covering the NIL industry, right? So much change. I would love if you could point out sort of a couple inflection points that you've seen between then and now that have really like redefined um, what is success in sports marketing. Well, when I started, there was no internet. So that was probably so a that. pretty big inflection point. Um, and then fast forward, I would say social media has been the biggest thing. What we've learned um, is controlling your narrative. Um, I had to force Coach Prime onto Twitter and then Instagram. Really? And now we can't get him off of it. Yeah. it it's like the, the, the curse of, of, of social media with, with him. But where I really saw it, um, where an athlete or a celebrity can control their narrative is when Coach had the blood clots and was really sick and nobody knew. And we would literally just take his phone and just put posts out there so nobody could make up what they wanted, like why he was in the hospital and, and things like that. And that was major for us. And then now, obviously, as the head coach of Colorado, he's held to a different set of standards and different rules. So every time a lot of the media decides to report things that are so false, instead of us running to put a press release out, we're just like, we got this, and we're going to put it. And now we're going to call front office sports, and you guys Please. are going to help us control the narrative a little better. So I would say those are it's probably the biggest thing for us. And speaking of Coach Prime, um, so before we got on stage, I asked Constance if she could think of a couple deals or projects that she's worked on that, um, that you guys would want to hear about. So we got the sunglasses. I think if you that guys does it remember right? the Coach Prime sunglass moment. Uh, I would love if you could tell us how that deal came together. So Coach wears sunglasses all the time. Ever since he played bandanas and sunglasses, and when he you know, had this national platform, he's like, I need a sunglass deal. And we worked so hard to find the right, whether it was manufacturer or brand, and there's some brands that passed that are kicking themselves in the behind right now. And Glenders stepped up for us, 
And we weren't supposed to launch until November, just because it was so late in the game. But when Coach Norvell decided to take a shot at Dion's mom, we literally said, get the factories going. We're going to launch these sunglasses this week. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, the head coach of um, Colorado State University took a shot during press that week and said, um, I was raised differently to take my sunglasses and hat off. And so Dion's mom didn't appreciate that too much. Um, so I think we showed them, like, be really careful about how you're going to take a shot at anybody, not just coach. So we were able to get the sunglasses in the locker room, I think, three days later. And we were live um, on that Friday. And I think that weekend was when we had both um, the big noon show from Fox and game day at that game. And everybody was in the sunglasses from The Rock to everybody on the, on the Fox desk. And I would love to sit back and pretend like, hey, this is like how you launch a brand. We had no clue, and we're so thankful to Coach Norvell for running his mouth um, <laughs> against Coach because, you know, it just really took us to another stratosphere with, with the glasses, and we've got new styles coming out, obviously, next uh, in a few weeks. I can't believe college football is here. So, so that would be a, a huge one on the branding side. And then when I was managing Snoop, um, he came to me, and I was like, okay, what's, like, your biggest dream? Forget guardrails. Forget what's possible. And he said, I um, want to coach my sons. They play, you know, Pop Warner football, but they don't want people like me in, in their league. This was in Orange County in California. And that's all I need to hear, because I've been an underdog my whole life. Um, and so when I hear somebody telling me you can't do something, you tell my client you can't do something, I'm like, really? Cool. So um, Commissioner Goodell wasn't the commissioner yet. It was still Commissioner Tagli. But when I, I called Roger and I said, I know you're going to think I'm nuts that I just left the NFL two years ago. I'm managing Snoop, and I want to bring him up to the headquarters for a meeting about us starting a Snoop Youth Football League. I'm like, hello? Like, hello? I was like, Silence like, on the here. other line. Oh, yeah. So we, uh, we came up, and to Snoop's credit, I was like, please do not smoke weed before we go to this meeting. It wasn't as acceptable. It wasn't as legal like, as it is now. I said, I don't care what we do after, but I need you to just not smell like weed for this meeting. And Maybe you can smoke, but just don't smell like weed. Exactly. Okay. That's you. He, he functions really well on it. It's amazing, obviously. And they literally just blessed it. And they said, you can use the, the marks and logos. And every year we play the Snooper Bowl at the Super Bowl, which, which they sanction that. So two things came from that. One, um, over 80,000 kids have, have played in the Snoop Youth Football League. I think the number was eight or ten went to the NFL and thousands upon thousands made it to college off of, of that, because academics was just as important, like off-field was as important as on-field. And then fast forward, um, we just uh, came out with our first feature film called The Underdogs. It was on Prime Video in January, which was inspired by the kids of the Snoop Youth Football League. So those are probably my two moments. I'll leave those. There it goes. At least you know that again. they're very durable and they don't break. Exactly. Um, but going back to the sunglasses deal, as a marketer, how do you decide when and how to acknowledge and jump on like some sort of controversy? I'm not sure if the Norvell comments were like, you know, they weren't necessarily a controversy for Coach Prime, maybe more for Coach Norvell, but like, you know, when do you decide to ignore something like that and when do you decide to utilize it in a campaign? We mostly ignore the noise. Like that's one of the coach has so many amazing you know, characteristics and, and just so much I love about him. But shutting out the noise is, no one does it better than him. Because if you listen to every critic and criticism and false narrative, you would run and hide in, in these woods somewhere. So it, that instance, like, that'll never happen again in my career. Like, I'd love to sit back and pretend like we knew that how that was going to go. But um, I knew the glasses would do well, but it just was over the moon. So, you know, you think the, the, the most important thing when you're partnering with a brand, for those of you that represent talent, they have to use the brand. They have to like the brand. They should be using the brand whether they're getting paid or not. And if you look at our roster, whether it's Aaron Andrews, who does drive an infinity, or um, Michael Strahan, who wears his clothing line top to bottom, everything that Coach Prime touches, he uses. And he, I, you can't even imagine the, the calls and texts I get from him hey, I, I need a coffee deal. He's like, but I want to own the coffee. And I'm like, okay. So off we go, and we actually are shooting a new coffee deal next weekend. Um, so that's the most important thing. Um, and I get it. Everybody needs money and needs a check. But 
the consumers today, the, you know, the, the fans, they know when you're so full of it. So, um, and, and like Wale was saying about keeping the main thing the main thing, it is so important that you always prioritize your on court or on field while you're also pursuing whatever it is. Like use your platform to, to branch out what, whatever it is that you want to do. I mean, we're seeing it now in a whole different way with the NIL that's going on. Um, we have four of the kids on, on Colorado and it's obviously been an interesting ride because every day it changes. Um, but for us, we keep telling these kids like, you haven't even made it to the pros yet. So like, let's stop worrying so much about your brand deals. Make sure you, you know, have great on, on field performance and they'll come. And you kind of anticipated my next question, but especially, no, that's okay. Especially with the younger athletes and the college athletes, please shed more wisdom about how, you know, if an athlete comes to you and says, what are your top three pieces of advice? You know, maybe outside what you just said or add something else. Um, so let's start with that. And, but then I'm also interested in how working with the college athletes versus the pro athletes versus a coach, you know, like how, is there any sort of category difference there when it comes to your role or is it just sort of personality driven? It's the experience that we have, I think the biggest challenge with because these kids now know their value and their worth when colleges are throwing seven figures at a kid coming out of high school, which is a whole other panel. So for us, it's, hey, like we've got one of the kids who it's his first year. I was like, if we get you two things, that's two things more than you could even have because you haven't proven yourself on the field yet. Once you prove yourself on the field, it, it's going to be coming. So it's managing expectations, especially because we've been working with, with these kids like Shador and Shiloh since, I've known them since you know six and seven years old and Travis we've had since he was a freshman at, at Jackson State. But now that they're all going on to the draft, all the vultures start circling. And they start making you know, big promises that I personally don't think they're going to be able to deliver on. And it's like you have to have a very trusting relationship with any of your clients and, and help them understand this is just the beginning. You've got a long career ahead of you. So you don't want to have too much out there. You want to keep it strategic. And again, it's, it's the same philosophy. Like, make sure you use these brands. And I, and I have to give credit to Shador, Shiloh, Travis, and now Jordan Seaton. Like, they, they get it, and, and they're doing really well. I mean, you can, I love when everybody always quotes, like, who sits where with the NAL space, and one of our kids is on it. I mean, Travis was on the cover of um, NCAA EA game, so. Yes, the video game, which I would argue is probably the most sort of highly anticipated NIL product. Um, you know, we've been reporting on it every single, every little detail. It's been amazing to see the players and even their reaction. They've done a great job, I have to give them credit, because like Shador has this whole thing where he waves the watch when he, he scores, and he's got this song now, Perfect Timing, and they incorporated his move into the game, which was nice. And we made sure other kids couldn't, in the game couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, so what is maybe, like, from your perspective, the biggest misconception about the NIL industry? Because I spend probably 50% of my job, if not more, reporting on trying to fact check all of these rumors that are coming out about how much the athletes are making or the impact that NIL is or isn't having on teams. So what do, what's, the, what's the fact check you want to put out there? So there's two different verticals. There's the brands, you know, deals and partnerships, which is NIL, and then there's the collectives who are the ones that are writing the checks to get the kids to come play at the schools. So it's two totally different, you know, groups, people of all the things. So I fully support these college kids being able to earn money for their name, image, and likeness. It's the collectives that's just turned college football upside down. Um, you know, when, when Coach Prime came into the, the college space, we didn't have any idea how tough this was going to be. And I have to give Colorado so much credit because they turned around in, in a year to get this collective going. Because as great as Coach Prime is, these kids still know they can go command seven figures at other schools, which is, like I said, another panel. I, so how much involvement do you have with collectives, right? Because, if at all, um, because as you said, it's a completely separate um, sort of area of NIL. In many ways, it is, it's a conversation with boosters, it's a conversation with coaches. Um, so what is your involvement there? 
Fortunately, this year, not as much. Um, when he took over, there was no alumni. Like, there was three or four great, great folks, you know, from Colorado, but they're all retired and, like, so excited, but nobody had the experience on how to, to get this up and running. So, by the grace of God, I have no idea how everybody came together, but it was literally, like, taking Coach to all these, you know, booster meetings and luncheons and dinners and golf tournaments. He doesn't play golf. We're like, can we do a fishing tournament? You know, it's, like, trying to really zero in on, like, what's going to work for, for the coaches because um, that's who everybody wanted to talk to. And then same with the kids. Like, when they're signing... Their, their contracts, you know, for the collective money, where, like, you still have to come to all these events. So some kids get it, some kids don't, and the ones that get it will be the ones that you see going on and on. But it was, it was a big part of our job. Thankfully, now they hired a great group who, uh, who took it over for us. And then I think I, I, I want to move on a little bit from NIL, but you guys have to indulge me. I'm the college sports reporter, so just give me one more second here. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes, and you don't have to maybe name names, right, but like what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen college athletes make when they're trying to secure deals or they're trying to build a brand for themselves? The biggest mistake is I think kids are making decisions based on money. And, and I get it. A lot of these kids, their families will never have seen the amount of money that's being thrown at them, but they've lost um, player development. I mean. Coach Steven retired, I think he's, he's publicly said it, because they're, they're not developing these players anymore because they can now jump into the portal if they're not happy and, and they can move on. And like I said, I think it's a really fine balance between the college athletes being able to earn money based off their name, image, and likeness, but to just go, like, uh, I mean, I can tell you this, Coach is very public about it. If a kid shows up and he literally says, well, what's my bag? He's like, we're done. And he doesn't want to hear from this kid because at the end of the day, you still have to love the game. Like, the love of the game has to come before getting this money. Doesn't mean they're not going to get the money, but he just always wants to make sure that the love of the game and the commitment and the passion comes first. So, so that's what I mean by, I think, making the decision on the money. Um, and then I, I just wanted to sort of switch to the media side. Um, Aaron Andrews, obviously. I've always been curious, like, how you work with a member of the media, as a member of the media, maybe you can just give me some free advice here. Um, uh, you know, how does that marketing situation, I guess, work differently from the athletes or the coaches or the people who, I mean, she, obviously she's on the field, but on the sidelines. So um, everyone's different. Uh, like, like Strahan, we have, you know, him on Fox Sports, but then he's a news anchor for Good Morning America, so he's got a whole different set of standards. Um, so you don't see him doing any commercials anymore except for the line that, that he owns. Um, but whether it's Aaron or um, anyone that, that, you know, Kurt Menefee, who's, who's on NFL on Fox and, and Good Day New York, I always have to get approvals from the networks because that's, that's always in first position. So you always have to go to the bosses and make sure. And there are some times if, I'm making this up, but if Ford's the big, um, you know, pregame sponsor or sideline sponsor, and then we come to them and say, hey, Aaron's got this commercial. They're like, you can't do it. And you understand that. But then we say, well, can you make an introduction to the sponsor? So that's probably, I think, one of the biggest issues is just navigating who's the sponsors of their, their boss's company and before you can figure out like, where they can go. All right. And I think we are just about out of time. But I want to wrap up with one last question. Looking out into the space, what excites you the most or, you know, uh, about what changes you might see over the next couple of years? Air conditioning? No, just kidding. I mean, <laughs> you, you guys, guys seriously, you're troopers spitzing. for staying here. Yeah. Um, I, I think the most exciting thing for, for me, because we produce a lot of content, is just seeing all the places we can take it now. Whereas before, you just had broadcast, and now there's streamers, and I think, you know, some of the social media companies are looking at more long form content. So that's probably the most exciting thing. And we, we joke about this too, like in the 90s and early 2000s, and Barry knows this, every athlete wanted to have a record company. And now they all want a production company. And I applaud everybody for leaning in and doing it, but I don't know that they understand how hard it is. Like Strahan's in the Bahamas, and I had him on pitches this week, like from the Bahamas, because he is all in, as all of our clients are. Um, we always say, like, we can't work harder than the client. Um, they have to want to be in it like we do. So I, I'd say just the opportunity for more content. Thank you so much. Can we give Constance a round of applause, please?